Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Is climate change really a planetary emergency? Or is the climate debate fueled by overheated climate models, inflated CO2 emission scenarios, disregard of basic data on human health and well-being, and relentless exaggeration by political interests claiming to speak for, quote, the science? It's hard to credit people who say they care about climate change when they don't bother to know anything about the subject. What we need to understand is how much warming is caused by humans, how much the Earth will warm in the 21st century, whether warming is really dangerous, whether we can afford to radically reduce CO2 emissions, and whether any reduction will actually improve the climate. With me to sort this out is Myra Niebel, Director of the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He also chairs the Cooler Heads Coalition whose focus is on sensible energy policies that benefit everyone. Myron, welcome. Thanks for having me, Bill. This is a big topic. Uh, it's a huge topic, yes. There's a lot of weather, yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of different opinions about the weather. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about today, just to frame it, is I want to talk about the science, the nature of the problem, the cost, the politics, the trade-offs. We've got 45 to 60 minutes. I'm sure we'll get into detail on all of it. But could you just frame what, what the climate debate is all about? And do we have a climate change problem? Uh, the debate exists on several levels, Bill. Uh, at the scientific level, the question is, well, there are several questions. Uh, is the climate warming as a result of human activity, primarily burning coal, oil, and natural gas, which produces carbon dioxide emissions? Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been going up. Uh, in 1800, they were probably around 270 parts per million. They're now at 400 parts per million. Uh, that's, that's one part in every 2,500. So there's, uh, there's, CO2 is a trace gas, but it is a greenhouse gas. Uh, it's not nearly as important as water vapor. Water vapor is the major greenhouse gas. And it's the greenhouse gases that make life possible on Earth by keeping the atmosphere warm enough for, for uh, life. Uh, so it, it's important, the greenhouse effect, so-called greenhouse effect is important. And, and, and what, are the, what are the components of greenhouse gases? Is, is carbon dioxide one of the components or is it the whole? No. Water vapor is the major greenhouse gas and, that, okay. and the clouds are included in that. And right. then you have CO2 and then you have a few other trace gases like methane and, and, and some really exotic gases. So. Uh, those are the those are the components. Now the question is, is CO two the driver of climate change, or is it the the control on the thermostat that that you 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 change the CO two knob and and you get warmer or colder? Well, that's the way the debate's framed. That's the way the debate is framed. Uh, there is not much evidence for that, but uh, the the debate as the global warming bandwagon got going in the nineteen eighties. Uh, everybody moved into that position that, well, we're, we're pretty confident that CO2 is what changes the climate. So we don't worry about changing solar activity. We don't worry about uh, ocean cycles. Uh, we uh, ignore uh, all kinds of other things that are driving climate change. And we focus on CO2 and say this is, the, this is what we have to worry about because warming will be really bad. It will be rapid. Uh, and it will have very significant impacts on human life and on, well, you and use, on terrestrial you, life in general. And you use the, the way, you use the way you use the phrase "pretty confident." It doesn't <laughs> sound uh, certain, and it also sounds like they just zeroed in on the one thing that maybe had something to do with the energy co with the oil companies and automobiles. And there's a there's a there's a political component to this, yes. which is pretty interesting. Very strong. Uh, and the oceans are also a very big factor. Yes. How do the, what part do the oceans play? Well, that's a matter of great debate. Uh, there's uh, solar physicists, of course, think that they would like to be in charge of the debate, say that the sun runs the climate and that solar variability is what changes the climate. Uh, they have some evidence for that. And of course, we have 
changing patterns in in the solar system and the Earth's uh, uh, planetary flight around the sun changes. That obviously, that's what gives us our seasons, for example, mm -hmm. uh, from summer to winter. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of factors there, and the oceans are uh, most of the heat and most of the carbon dioxide is in the oceans. Mm -hmm. And that's because water is much denser than air and therefore can hold a lot more heat. Mm -hmm. So the oceans, because of, of the fact that the earth revolves around the sun, uh, the oceans are sloshing around. There are natural cycles in, in uh, ocean currents. There's something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is actually multi-decadal. There's the Atlantic Oscillation. And these things have strong impacts on the climate, and they're cyclical. Uh, that is, you have a period where uh, the, the Pacific is warmer uh, in, in parts, and then it moves over and it's warmer in a different part, and that will that will change the climate. The most obvious uh, impact of that is El Ninos and La Ninas. Well, the big, I mean, the, the debate, though, is, is focused on CO2 and then the piece of CO2 that's contributed by human beings. And I'm, as I'm listening to what you're saying, though, there are, many other factors involved in climate besides just the man-made piece that contributes to CO2. It's a very complex system and therefore it requires lots of different types of science, lots of different ex times, types of expertise. It's not just physics and chemistry, it's all kinds of things. Well, so can you put a, uh, can you put a percentage on what part of climate might be be influenced by CO2 versus the sun versus the ocean versus uh, the moon versus, uh, I don't know where else we could go with the culprits. Is there, well, the, has the science taken us towards, okay, well, if we do this with CO2, this will be the outcome for, uh, for the climate? The official climate establishment claims that most of the warming since 1900 uh, can be attributed to human activity, primarily burning coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, and that's based on uh, very complicated computer models that uh, predict uh, or try to predict what the future climate will be. And, and what they've done is they've tuned these models to past climate change, and they then extrapolate that out into the future. Now, the problem with that is that the initial studies on how sensitive the climate is to CO2, varying levels of CO2, mm -hmm. this is called climate sensitivity, uh, the initial studies said that the climate, uh, uh, concluded that the climate was very sensitive to changes in CO2. More recent studies uh, find much less sensitivity. Uh, the more recent studies, I believe, are much, much more credible because they're based much more based on data rather than theory. Uh, and the fact is that the official climate establishment is very resistant to accepting new science. They want, they want, they want to hold on to the old science that the climate is very sensitive to CO2. Well, the models have been wildly, they've wildly overstated the predicted warming and if you go back and take a model, and let's say a model from 1980 and what it predicted, but then you go back and overlay that versus what actually happened, they don't do right. so well. That's, that's right. I think, in fact, uh, it's not unfair to say that the models have been falsified. That is to say, we, we had these predictions, we now have data which contradicts the models, and we can say that the models don't work. They have been scientifically falsified by the, essentially the scientific method. Well, I I'm tend to get a little wonky, but mm -hmm. I care about the scientific method, and as I read about what that is, it's experimentation, testing of competing hypotheses, objective and careful peer review, discerning correlation from causation, and controlling natural variability. Sounds like that's not happening with climate science. Not most not much of the time yes there's there's there are gaps there we could we could go through and uh, look in detail at each one of those but yes there are the climate science is not normal science it it has become something different
you might call it postmodern science or post -nor <laughs> post post normal science. And that's because it's been captured by political and economic agendas. Well, it's uh, of course science scientists are still running the agenda, but they have they have made certain commitments uh, that aren't really very scientific, and I think the motives vary. I think they're not all political, they're not all economic. Uh, but there are the politics and economics have, have definitely become inv involved. Uh, you're, you're watching the Bill Walton show. I'm here with Myron Ebel of the uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute as an expert in all things climate and climate science is what we're talking about right now. Uh, so the, the science that uh, that you're referring to, is that driven by the what is it, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? Is that the is that the body that, that creates the uh, uh, sprinkles the holy water on science research? Yes, largely. Um, the, the first thing is that virtually all climate science is government funded. So uh, we have a long uh, history in the United States now, going back uh, to the 1980s, of uh, the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation and NOAA and NASA funding <coughs> science uh, designed to look for the human signal in climate change. And uh, the, the funding has been vastly disproportionate for looking at the human signal compared to looking at. So, so may I say that the other way? They've assumed the conclusion. They're well, assuming that this, this is going to be man-made, and therefore we're looking for the arrows that point in that direction? Yeah, all, all the scientific funding is looking for that, that answer. And so if you don't find that answer, you tend not to get funded. Well, I think you've got a number on the dollars that are getting spent on science driven by the, the IPCC and science or dollars that go to uh, client skeptics. What's the ratio? Oh, I, I don't know, but it's it's probably a thousand to one. I think I read that it was sixty eight hundred dollars that goes to the the, 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 the consensus. And one dollar sixty eight hundred to one. Okay, sixty eight hundred to one. Well, I, I was. You see, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm lowballing. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm way too conservative in my estimates here. Well, uh, you know, have, have you been called a climate denier? Yes, and of course, most any anyone who objects or disagrees with the entire agenda now is called a climate denier. It, it used to be somewhat limited to to people like me and a few scientists who who were uh, public in their opposition to, to the consensus. But now it's really anybody who, who doesn't adopt the entire agenda. But you, will, you, you acknowledge the temperatures have risen in the last 100 years, but just not that much. And the question is whether even that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's, that's right. I mean, the, the, the first question is, is this really a crisis? Yeah. And I think you know, I have no doubt that it's not a crisis. Uh, and so, of course, that immediately puts me into the denier camp. But if you go down the list, I, I, I meet most of the other criteria as well. Well, but we're getting, we're getting warnings from people who are in the everything's dire that uh, things like uh, climate change is sapping nutrients from our food. Uh, we have... Uh, what else do we have here? We have, uh, anyway, while well, I'm looking around for it, but there are all sorts of wild claims about how the uh, uh, everybody's leaving Africa because the temperatures have reached 130. We've got incredible windstorms in the Midwest because of this. All the hurricanes of, uh, that have happened have all because of climate change, and yet the data shows there really hasn't been an increase in the number of hurricanes in the last 100 years. There have been cycles. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the last... Uh, 12, 15 years, we've been in a low phase, and it's only the last couple of years that we've gotten back into a higher phase with hurricane activity. No, there, there are all kinds of claims about impacts, and if you look at the actual science, and many times if you look at the IPCC reports, you find that the claims about the impacts are exaggerated or, or just simply aren't there, and when this, when, you know, one of these comes out in the media and then it's shot down, then they move to another one. So uh, there's really, there, it's, it's, it's like playing whack-a-mole uh, with, with uh, climate impacts. You can show that uh, 
there is no increase in tornado activity or droughts or floods or hurricane activity. There's no, uh, we can go through the whole long list. There's, there's no increase in malaria or other tropical diseases. Uh, the polar bears are not uh, uh, declining in number. They're, they've been increasing in number, largely because hunting has been, has been uh, restricted, but there's, there, well, there are more I, polar bears I, now than there were I, in I 1950. I think I learned there were 5,000 polar bears in 1960, mm -hmm. and now there are 30,000. 25 or 30, yeah. Okay, so there's well. a lot of polar bears, yeah. Uh, but that's not what you would gather by listening to the mainstream media and the photos of, of uh, sick and diseased polar bears. So the, this uh, kind of claim that we were already seeing the impacts is the one, I, I think it's really the Achilles heel of the, uh, the climate movement. Or Would bandwagon. you see any negative impact from the climate change, from the rise in temperatures that we've seen so far? Yeah, yeah sure, but they're very minor. Uh, I think they're, they're really strongly outweighed by the benefits of warmer temperatures. By and large, uh, we're, in a, you know, we're in an interglacial period. We're, uh, we're 13, 14,000 years into an interglacial period We've had several million years of ice ages, which last about 100,000 years, followed by interglacial periods, which last about 15,000 years. So this is a very cold part of the Earth's history. Uh, and uh, most of the warming that we've seen since 1800 has been a recovery from the Little Ice Age, which was a huge uh, uh, problem for people living in northern latitudes. Mm -hmm. In in the uh, in pre the well, previous several centuries, hard to live in Minnesota when you're under 50 feet of ice. Right. Well, that was that was in fact in in the ice age it was more like two miles of ice. So, okay. Uh, so yes, the so the little ice age was a big problem for people living in Europe, uh, North America, and China, which is the grain belt of the world, uh, and it led to. Uh, disaster after disaster for humankind, including lots of starvation and lots of disease. Since we've recovered, uh, since the climate has recovered from the Little Ice Age, we've got uh, a, lot, a lot of positives in that warming in terms of human flourishing, uh, in, ter in terms of the benefits of, of warmer weather over colder weather. And to just get slightly technical, we keep hearing about heat waves and how it's going to uh, hurt humanity, but many, many more people die from cold weather than from hot weather. And that trend has, uh, that divergence has actually, is actually wider now because of the prevalence of air conditioning in hot places. I think it's almost, the ratio is almost 99 to one. Well, it's, uh, it, it varies from place to place, okay. but it's, it's more like I'd say 10 to one in most places. But, uh, we see a lot of people uh, in Northern Europe now because of the increase in electricity prices are, are not able to heat their homes adequately and they're dying uh, of cold weather, uh, cold temperatures in the winter now. Uh, and so uh, energy poverty is probably a much bigger problem today than any of the negatives caused by global warming. Well, and, and the CO2 changes have actually caused the earth to become more greener. Yes, and that's something that the, uh, the, the climate crowd is having a hard time dealing with because it's based on NASA satellite photography uh, from the weather satellites, which went up in 79. Uh, and it shows very clearly that the, the northern arboreal forests are greening, the, uh, the uh, rainforests are greening, and more recently uh, there has been uh, research that shows that the grasslands are greening, and they're more... There are more acres of grassland than any other type of uh, vegetation. So the grasslands are becoming denser, the rainforests are becoming denser, and the, and the northern forests are becoming denser. So the earth is greening. Yet that's not what we hear. What we're hearing is just exactly the opposite. Uh, I'm, uh, I think the, um, I think of the, in the category of extreme weather, uh, People have died from extreme weather globally has decreased by 99%. Uh, there's no strength, no, no trend in the strength or frequency of U.S. landfalling hurricanes, no change in flood mag magnitudes, and also the total areas burned by wildfires have been 
reduced. So <laughs> we're, we're, why, why am I feel like I'm living in a different world when I read this versus what I'm hearing on, say, CNN? You know, CNN during the debate uh, instructed all the candidates. They had, the, the, what, that seven-hour debate mm -hmm. where they were talking about the client. You, the did you watch that? I was counting on you to watch it. Well, I was, all about I was it. counting on someone else. <laughs> Rat. I was going to leverage your 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 time, but it's that's, a way. I thought it was a way for CNN to to uh, lower their ratings. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Tampkin, the public editor for CNN beforehand, insisted the moderators should proceed on the assumption that climate is in crisis and limit themselves to calling for action and faulting inaction. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, okay. uh, look, the, all right, well, it, that, it, I think it's time <laughs> to turn to the politics of this. Let me just, uh, you're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Myron Evil, Competitive Enterprise Institute, and I'm having my eyes opened about what's really happening with climate, and it's not what I'm reading about in the New York Times. Myron, uh, you've talked about something called the I mean, who's benefiting from the from the direness that we're hearing about climate? You've used a metaphor. I think it had to do with the prohibition. Uh, well, you'll have to remind me what that metaphor was, Bill. I think you said bootleggers and Baptists. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, Bruce Yandel, a wonderful economist, now retired from Clemson University, some uh, decades ago, came up with the uh, the observ the very uh, keen observation that every political uh, uh, movement or every attempt to get something politically had two wings, and he called them Baptists and bootleggers. And this was from uh, the, the era when uh, people were, in, particularly in the South, where there are a lot of Baptists, were trying to, uh, to, to keep uh, dry laws in their counties in place. So, so prohibition was over, but they were trying to uh, to keep uh, alcohol sales forbidden. Well, the, the Baptists were for that because they were against alcohol and drinking. They were for temperance. And, but the bootleggers were for it too because if alcohol became legal, then they would go out of business. So the bootleggers would supply the, the, uh, the funding for this effort to keep the county dry. And the Baptists would provide the moral high ground and the moral principles to keep the to argue to keep the county dry. So you see this, uh, Bruce uh, Yandel has applied this and others have applied it to almost every political issue and you see, always see that, that ev almost every uh, uh, movement will have bab the Baptist wing and the bootlegger wing. In some cases it's the same people. I mean Al Gore is a good example of that in the global warming debate. He's, he's the he high wins the Nobel Prize. He's the moral spokesman, but he's also trying to get become a billionaire based on selling uh, green energy. So, uh, just just uh, just on a side note, the studio we're in started life. We believe local legend has it as a as a speakeasy, mm -hmm. and so I guess when they got rid of prohibition, we, they had to find something else I'll to do with do it. Me. And fast forward eighty years, and here we are. are. Well, <laughs> yes. So the bootleggers in the case of uh, the environmental world or the, you know, I guess you've got tax credits and there's all the research dollars going into it. There's the political power that comes from uh, bringing, uh, you know, bringing everything under control to, to fix the climate. And then we've got the wind and, and solar manufacturers and all the other people that benefit from that. Is that, mm -hmm. is that pretty much what the, what, is that what the bootleggers look like here? Uh, yes, uh, and and the environmental pressure groups and uh, well, the religious community has been brought in to try to say that well, you know, it's a crime not to be doing something to solve the planetary emergency. And then the academic community have a huge amount of uh, of uh, moral uh, prestige, uh, and and that's interesting because of course they're direct financial beneficiaries of. Of the global warming issue, because uh, the the amount of money going into global warming research is probably twenty times higher than it was before. The uh, that may be again an underestimate of of before the crisis uh, was announced in the late eighties. So, well, Bernie Sanders in the last debate said that we needed to get all of our power from electricity sourced through. Uh, 
wind and solar and do it within 10 years. Explain why that's tough to do. Uh, 20, 30, 50 years ago, the world got 80% of its energy from burning coal, oil, and natural gas, the three hydrocarbons or fossil fuels. Uh, today, the world gets 80% of its energy from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. Now, the percentages have changed. There's less coal in, in the United States, but in fact, there's a lot of coal being burned in China and India now. So, uh, despite all of this effort to subsidize and promote wind and solar power uh, and, uh, and, and a few other renewables, what we see is that they are they are providing some of the increased <clears throat> global supply of energy because remember if we get 80 percent of our energy from coal oil and natural gas today we're using a lot more energy globally than we were 30 40 50 years ago mm -hmm. so it's a much bigger pie so wind and solar are providing a fraction of that and it's an increasing amount but it hasn't changed the percentage so when, when people like uh, Senator Sanders talk about we need to switch over completely, they're first going to have to explain how it is after uh, 20 to 30 years of subsidizing uh, wind and solar, they haven't been able to increase their global percentage of the energy that they supply. So I think that's the first problem. It's just it's completely impractical in other respects as well, technologically. Uh, the amount of stuff that you have to dig up, minerals, heavy metals, that you have to dig up to build all these windmills and solar panels is far beyond the current capacities of the industry. And in fact, most of the people who want wind and solar are against mining. They, they oppose mining projects. So there's, that's another technological problem. And then the, the, I'll just mention the other big one, which is the grid, the electric grid won't operate with high percentages of intermittent and unreliable sources of power. And the wind doesn't blow all the time, and the sun doesn't shine all the time, and it never shines at night. So uh, people in Northern Europe, who uh, there was just a story in the news in, in England, people are starting to complain about, they've been sold these solar panels on lo with loans, and they've been told that they will uh, get enough electricity back to more than pay for the solar panels and they will make out like bandits. Well, it turns out England is not, a, in most parts of England, it isn't very sunny and it's also very far in the north. So in the winter, it's, it's not sunny at all. It's a cloudy kind of gloomy place. And so they're all finding out that these, they were sold a bill of goods when they put solar panels on their houses. So the, the technological uh, impediments to going all renewable are uh, immense. So if fossil fuels are 81% or, or roughly, uh, we all have, also have nuclear and we have hydroelectric. Mm -hmm. And wind and solar, what, are about 6% now of the total? Uh, in the United States, yes, I think so. And one of the, I also learned that just in terms of the air, air, acres or miles of square miles that you'd need to do solar or the wind farms, uh, for an equal amount of space, it, fossil fuels produce 110 times the energy. And I'm trying to envision what Bernie has in mind when all of what Massachusetts is, is uh, he's from Massachusetts, I can't remember. Vermont. What, Vermont, yeah. Um, so we're going to have all of Massachusetts or Vermont covered with solar panels and it's in New England and it's cold and there's winter there too. It's a little bit like Great Britain. Then we're going to have all these wind farms maybe off of Nantucket, I'm sure. Martha's Vineyard? Where are we going to put these wind, <laughs> where are we going to put these wind farms? <laughs> well, that's a really good point. The acreage that types of energy uh, <clears throat> take up, I mean, the reason fossil fuels are are such a great source of energy is because, first of all, they don't take up a lot of land because we're digging under the ground to get them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the footprint of an oil well and a pipeline or a coal mine is pretty small. Uh, and the second thing is that they're very concentrated sources of energy. There's a, just an awful lot of energy in a gallon of gasoline from, from oil. There's an awful lot of energy at a very low price from a ton of coal. Uh, wind and solar are very diffuse, and so you need a lot of uh, a lot of land and you need a lot of 
uh, equipment to, uh, to, to uh, harvest that source of energy, those two sources of energy. Uh, so the, there have been estimates that the Green New Deal, if it were implemented, which is very similar to uh, the idea that we're going to get off of coal, oil, and natural gas in 10 years, would take an area uh, comparable to the size of California, which is our third largest state, uh, to, well, where we get, you know, the, the environmental consequences of taking up all that land with windmills and solar panels are just, uh, they're outrageous. Uh, where, you know, we, we have worries about uh, building a, one pipeline and what it might do to, uh, to the environment, and yet we're going to take over an area the size of California with, with solar farms. I mean, it's, it really is crazy. Well, so we're continuing to wander through this. It, it seems like everything I learned, it's hard to hold the view that, that uh, the, 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 if climate is a problem, this is not the solution. Now, the other solution is they think we should do things like consume less meat. <laughs> Why, what, what's consuming less meat going to do for the CO2 uh, greenhouse gas uh, issue? Well, there's, there's a claim that uh, growing <clears throat> animals is very uh, inefficient in terms of calories, that you, can, you need much less energy and water to, to produce uh, wheat for bread than you do for, to produce uh, grass for cows. But uh, the problem with that thinking is people don't understand. I, I said before that grasslands are the largest acreage in the, in the world. Uh, much more than farmland or forest. And uh, grasslands is where we graze sheep and cows and goats. And uh, that's, if you, if you got rid of meat eating, you would be taking out uh, all of the hundreds of millions of acres that are devoted to providing uh, pasture for animals. And so uh, this would put a huge amount of pressure on uh, our farmland to produce uh, essentially, the calorie, most of our calories come from rice, corn, wheat. Uh, and uh, so we would have to vastly expand uh, the amount of farmland to, to get enough calories for the world's population. So this is, uh, this, this, people, people don't understand where our food comes from when they start talking about we need to two, stop Two phrases right. jump out. I'm trained in economics, and you've got opportunity costs. Yes. And unintended consequences. Yes. And it seems like every time somebody says, gee, this is a really bright idea, they're ignoring all the other third, second, fifth, tenth order impact. That's, that's what we're talking about Those here. are the two most important uh, uh, pieces of, of analysis, opportunity costs and unintended consequences of all political policies, right? That's what you always find is that the people promoting them uh, need, need to look more carefully at the opportunity costs and the unintended consequences. Consequences. I mean, the fact is, in global warming, we we talk about the consequences and the costs of global warming, but why don't we ever talk about the costs of global warming policies? Well, if you do, you find out the costs of global warming policies are at least one order of magnitude and probably two orders of magnitude. That is, ten to a hundred times more than the consequences of global warming. So let me make sure I heard that one order of magnitude is a hundred times more. Ten. Ten times ten, more. Ten times more. Two two orders of magnitude would be a hundred times more. Well, that's that's the kind of world we live in. We're talking about solving saving the world from, from global warming when the costs of doing so will be immensely greater than the costs of dealing just living with whatever consequences global warming gives us. And as we've already talked about, at least so far, most of the consequences of global warming are beneficial to human beings and to the planet. So let's tick off the benefits again. Greening earth, yeah, longevity. Let's Could, stop with greening earth. Okay. Remember, greening earth is not primarily caused by warmer temperatures. It's a direct consequence of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is required for by most plants for photosynthesizing solar energy into plant energy into calories. So uh, when we uh, talk about the, the impacts of, of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, uh, yes, there's an indirect impact on the climate, but there's a direct impact on plant growth. So uh, plants are using 
uh, uh, higher CO2 levels to grow faster uh, and to grow bigger and to, uh, the, the other thing about CO2 levels is that, you, that uh, most plants are much hardier uh, and much more less susceptible to things like drought uh, if, if, the high, if the CO2 level is higher. So this is, this is a, an area that the global warming folks don't like to talk about, as you might, as you might imagine. That well, they, why? Why they don't like to talk about it? Well, the, so if the CO2 concentrations are overwhelmingly positive, the other, the other aspect of fossil fuels is that if you get fussy about fossil fuels, you're not only talking about the United States, you're talking about China, Russia, India, the rest of the world, the whole developing world, and fossil fuels have done an awful lot to lift billions of people out of poverty because it's fueled all the technology that's made life better, more productive, it's, they've been, they've been uh, better fed, they're living longer, uh, the re incidence of disease is lower. I mean, it, it's sort of, it, it's sort of like if you had to invent a magical uh, thing that would that would that would cause human prosperity, you'd call it fossil fuel. Human flourishing is heavily dependent upon access to energy. If we don't have access to to affordable energy, then uh, we're going to live much more miserable lives. And uh, you know, most of most <clears throat> human. Most energy used to be provided by human labor and, and draft animals. Now, nearly all of it is provided by modern energy, and that can include solar and wind. But uh, human flourishing is something, uh, and, the, and, and the, the energy aspect of it is something that we take for granted in, in, the, in the United States and in, in most of the developed world. And we forget what life is like in, in an African village or an Indian village where they don't have access to electricity. Uh, people need to think about what it's like. Now, it's fun to go out and go camping in, in, uh, in a, a wild area and live for a few days without electricity, but it's really nice to get back to, to the electricity. And, so, and also, modern transportation is 90 over 90% depended upon I was, in the, I was in the Army. I don't go camping. Yeah, you don't camp. <laughs> you don't do camping. Uh, so, so people forget the, that human flourishing depends upon energy, and that the problem in the world is not that we have too much energy. It's that we have not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. There's still uh, uh, over a billion people who don't have access to electricity, and there's still uh, probably 3 billion people in the hot countries like India and Indonesia, who don't have access to air conditioning. Well, life, you know, even here in the United States, uh, air conditioning continues to become a push northward. I mean, people in Michigan and, and, uh, and North Dakota have air Did, conditioning now. Didn't some now. state just recently mandate that everybody will have air conditioning and they made that a, uh, an entitlement? Uh, that's, or was that, I just dreaming that? I don't know. I mean, seems likely it's going to Ca happen. California is, is cities are starting to ban yeah. natural gas hookups, so that's that's the other side. Of it. We have two political movements here in this country. One is is for more energy and for the benefits of energy, and one is for you know less less energy. And but without consequence. Without consequence. Without consequence. Right. That's right. Uh, well, I don't. You know, I want to probe a little bit on this, the impact of fossil fuels, which I'd never really thought about. You think about the Industrial Revolution lifting billions of people out of poverty more recently in the 20, 20, 21st century rapidly. Um, but that was really driven in part by the, by the fossil fuel revolution that was uh, creating the, the power to, to, to uh, run these machines. Yes. I, I mean, and, and, and think about it, before railroads and before cars, uh, we, we take mobility for granted as well as, as having well-heated and well-cooled houses and well-lighted uh, streets and well-lighted houses. Uh, mobility was, was really only for the upper class uh, until, until steam engines started burning coal and they built railroads. Uh, you know, most people, if they wanted to go somewhere, had to walk, and if you were well-off, you could have a horse, and if you were very well-off, you could have a carriage with horses. But today, people in this country just take it for granted that they can get into their car and drive across the country. 
Uh, you're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Myron E. Bill, and we are talking about the benefits of fossil fuels and the, uh, the growth that's been generated over the, over the last couple of centuries because of them and why it's probably a good idea not to get rid of them. Uh, but you mentioned in, you just mentioned something about the, the, the I, I use the word, the elites. I mean, isn't, it, isn't this sort of a, uh, a luxury belief to believe that we're going to be doing all these things to clean up the earth and not use fossil fuels and we're going to save ourselves from rising seas? In the first place, there's no evidence the seas are going to rise, but this is very much an elite versus the rest of everybody else. And that's not only the rest of everybody else here in the United States, but it's all the other countries that are working to reach our level of prosperity. I think that's completely right. Uh, the, the problem in this debate is that you have a bunch of wealthy people who don't mind. Well, first of all, the percentage of income that you pay on ener for energy, both for electri electricity, for heating, and for your car, or other mode of transport, the percentage that you pay is much higher among poor people than it is wealthy people. And that is to say that, okay, you may live in a big house and somebody over here may live in a small house, but the percentage you pay on heating and cooling is very similar. So wealthy people don't understand that energy costs are really important to people lower down on the income scale because if their if their electric bill doubled and their uh, transportation bill doubled it wouldn't bother them very much uh, but if you're uh, lower middle class and below uh, in terms of income you're going to find that people are very sensitive to increases in energy costs and that's why when the price of gasoline goes up we have recessions in this country and that's why uh, people who, when they are polled about global warming, uh, the, the majority of Americans think we should be doing something about global warming, and then if you ask them how much they would be willing to pay for it, it tends to be one, between one and five dollars a month. Well, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to well, cough well, up the trillions well, you need. Well, well we have, we have, we have a, a CEI did a study based on other economic studies that estimated that the first year of the Green New Deal would cost an average family in, in several states $70,000. Well, that's a little more than $5 a month. Well, yes. Uh, going a slightly different direction, we're talking about the environment, we're talking about climate change, but the environment issue, environmental issues are, are much, much more diverse than just rising temperatures and climate change. There's also habitat and species protection. And I'm sort of stunned, and you pointed this out to me, that something like the Audubon Society that's been trying to save birds for, um, and properly so, and to protect, protect the habitat, have now thrown in with the, with the uh, green industry, green energy uh, uh, movement, and they're creating windmills that are killing millions of birds. How would it, and so, okay, I'm, that, that's an aside, really, but my, I guess my other question is, can you separate climate change from habitat and species protection? Well, you know, the, the claim is that, that, if, that the Audubon Society is now promoting is that, that global warming will do more to damage the habitat for the birds that they care about than uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of windmills. Okay, you've already convinced me that's not true. Well, that isn't true. Uh, okay. So the, I think the environmental movement has a problem. They were, they were not the initiators of, of the global warming fad, uh, and they were, in fact, reluctant to get onto the bandwagon. But once they did, what's happened is that all of the other environmental issues, many of which, are, as you point out, are actually serious and they're real qu questions to debate here about how to better protect the environment, they're now totally on the global warming bandwagon, and we've, uh, they've, they've essentially uh, ignored or given up on uh, a, a wide array of, of environmental issues that they're, you know, they probably should be caring more about than they are about global warming. What are those issues? Well, uh, I, I, I don't want to sound like sound like a green, so I'm going to say that. Well, the, we're all the, we're all we're all environmentalists. I mean, nobody. It's like. Who in, the, who in the world believes in dirty air and dirty water? I mean, it's not exactly uh, 
I mean, everybody in a certain sense is an environmentalist. So yes. go, be go, if you well, want to go green, it's good, it's good with me. Well, <laughs> in the first place, uh, it, you mentioned dirty air and dirty water. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact is that the, the environmental legislation passed in the uh, 1960s and 70s, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, have been largely successful. We have the cleanest mm -hmm. air and water, by and large, in the world. The we initial still, EPA regulations were terrific. Well, they okay, could have well, been. They, go a little far, they could right? have been well, better, you, you, but yeah. but but they have. But they did their job. They have it, it, the costs in many cases have yeah. been uh, e extravagant, but they did their job. So we have, by and large, we still have pockets of air pollution. We still have areas that have. Uh, uh, where water pollution is a problem, but by and large, we have the, the cleanest air and water in the world. So uh, the question is, what is the environmental movement supposed to be doing if they've accomplished their purpose? Mm -hmm. And on, on the pollution front, they've moved to calling carbon dioxide a pollutant. Carbon pollution is now what we're fighting. And so that's, that's the, the kind of move that they've made. On the on the land and and critters front, uh, they have basically decided that habitat protect protecting uh, the environment for wildlife is less important than saving the planet from global warming. Wow! So, uh, you know, they they have a they have an identity crisis, I would say, uh, in in the movement. Because I had I had Ron Maxwell and Skipper Darlington on. Skipper's got something called AS, Africa ASAP. He's trying to save uh, elephants in Africa mm -hmm. from poaching, and it's a very important thing he's doing. And it got well, me aware of. Go ahead. Well, you're absolutely right, Bill. But the problem in Africa is the lack of defined property rights. Uh, and and we have that to some extent in the American West, where the federal government owns all the land. But mm -hmm. in Africa, the the lack of, of property rights and private property ownership uh, has meant that it's very difficult to protect wildlife. And, and the poaching issue could, would go away, and it has gone away in countries that have assigned ownership of elephants and other wildlife to the local villages. So if Africa were owned by private landowners. Or by village, or by, by villages, village landowners. By villages who had their own defined property, they would protect the elephants. That's right. And that, that in fact, was what was the case in Zimbabwe for a number of years until Mugabe uh, completely destroyed the country. So we've been talking about helicopters to surveil poachers. It's a better idea just to get to defined property if rights the, so that people if, take care of it themselves. If the local people own the elephants, they'll make they'll make short work of the poachers. Okay. Uh, coming back to their metaphor, bootleggers and Baptists, uh, you talk about the mission drift. You, I've got a list here of environmental groups and their funding, and there's hundreds and hundreds, of, if not billions of dollars that go to these groups. And if they've solved their primary mission, which say is pollution, then they redefine the mission to include CO2 so they can keep the funding coming. So there's a certain amount of self-interest to redefine the problem so they can keep donors agitated to send send money. In other words, this works a lot like the left and the right in terms of gin up uh, Absolutely. Uh, the base. Well, and the environmental groups have changed dramatically. For, uh, their funding has changed dramatically. When they first started out, they were grassroots groups. That The Sierra Club is a good example. Uh, they have a lot of members, and members paid their dues, and that's how the organization operated. Then they got into direct mail fundraising. And so people who weren't perhaps uh, didn't want to be members, but they wanted to give money for a cause, uh, that's changed. Now almost all the environmental groups are primarily funded by major charitable foundations. These charitable foundations are multi-billion. Pew Charitable Trust is the classic example. Pew, of course, was founded by the Pew family on the basis of the Sun Oil Company fortune. Uh, so so it, it, big oil is, is funding a, a large part of the environmental movement. You see it also with the, uh, the Rockefellers, uh, uh, Stan the Standard Oil mega fortune. Uh, they're, they're, they're key. They're, they don't have the biggest amounts of money, but they're key. Uh, and now Silicon Valley, uh, the Hewlett's, the Packard's, 
uh, and several others are, Tom Steyer is a, a more recent example, they are now funding uh, the, the environmental movement. So it's become an elite movement. It doesn't represent the grassroots. It doesn't represent normal people. It represents the interests of uh, the, the, the wealthiest people in this country and the foundations that they control. Uh, lines of action. What are you working on at CEI? What are we, you're also head of the Cooler Heads Coalition. What, uh, you've been incredibly uh, illuminating about what is a problem, what isn't a problem. What do you see um, we ought to be doing to, uh, to uh, A, get people thinking about this the proper way and B, doing the right things? Uh, there's still a great deal of uh, skepticism in the American public about about global warming being a crisis. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is we need to continue to provide people with uh, with accurate and adequate information that will allow them to have some confidence in their in their beliefs that global warming might be a problem, but it's not a crisis, uh, and that and that the costs of doing something about it are uh, unbelievably large. Uh, the second thing is. Uh, the Trump administration has done a pretty good job in rolling back the worst regulatory excesses of the Obama years, uh, particularly on climate and energy. Uh, and EPA is, is continuing to move through that deregulatory process. The federal lands and offshore areas are now under the Interior Department. They're still allowing oil and gas production. They're trying to encourage it. So we're now the world's energy superpower. We produce more oil, natural gas, and coal than any other nation in the world. So uh, that, that wasn't the case 20 years ago, uh, but it is today, and that's providing immense economic benefits. But th I think the real problem is that the Trump administration and uh, the Republicans in Congress were also complicit in this, have not taken on the official science we have not only the, uh, the United Nations official government rep scientific reports, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but we also have this thing called the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which every so often produces a national climate assessment. The, the administration has not done anything to change the, uh, to improve the preparation of these reports, and they haven't taken on the major regulatory obstacle, which is called the endangerment finding. Well, I should say there are two. President Trump got us out of the Paris Climate Treaty. It was uh, one of his campaign promises. He's done it. He's, he's, he's in the process of doing it. But the Paris Climate Treaty could come back if uh, whenever uh, a different president occupies the Oval Office. So that's one problem that we're working on, and the second is this thing called the endangerment finding. Do you want to know about the endangerment I finding? I do want to know about the endangerment <laughs> finding. <laughs> well, in 2007... I also want to ask you about the Paris Treaty, but let's do the endangerment finding. In 2007, the, the, the Supreme Court ruled five to four in a totally incoherent and, and pathetic decision that the Clean Air Act allowed the regulation of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, and that the EPA then needed to decide whether the Clean Air Act was an appropriate uh, uh, legislative and regulatory tool for regulating greenhouse gas emissions and whether they should go ahead and do it. So uh, that was in 2007. In two, late 2009, the Obama administration, the EPA ruled, made a ruling that greenhouse gas emissions endanger public health and welfare in danger, that's the endangerment finding, mm -hmm. and therefore they could go ahead and regulate greenhouse gas emissions, primarily carbon dioxide from burning coal oil and natural gas, under the Clean Air Act. So as long as the endangerment finding is in place, mm -hmm. uh, we have a problem in this country. And so one of the things we're working on at CEI and, and are very interested in trying to convince the, the people at, at the EPA and, and the White House who don't seem to get it that the endangerment finding has to be reopened and reviewed uh, on the basis of uh, the fact that it was prepared improperly in the first place and that new science, new scientific research undermines the conclusions that were made in 2009. So we think we have a very strong case for reopening and, and uh, 
take, uh, revoking the endangerment finding, but we can't convince the administration. We haven't so far been able to convince the administration. And the, and the, and the one word, one sentence would be no, lo no longer determined that CO2 endangers things. If you, if you took that out, then they you'd can't be done. Then, well, it would then put this issue back to where it belongs, Congress. Yeah. Congress, if, if, if the American people want to do something about global warming, we need to well, write laws, pass well, laws, getting, enact laws. Getting Congress to pass laws and do their job? Well, I know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a stretch, but, but this is, look, we can't let the regulatory state take over our lives without Congress having to say that's okay. And I don't think Congress will say that's okay because I don't think the American people will put up with it if they have a choice. But uh, as long as the regulators don't, are not accountable to anyone, including Congress, then uh, they're gonna keep trying to regulate. Those sound like great words to wrap this, wrap this up. We can't let the regulatory state take over our lives. Yes. And that's essentially what the green and environmental issues are really all about. That is the, that the global warming bandwagon as it has moved towards what is now the Green New Deal is an attempt to uh, force people to do whatever the regulatory state, not the government, the regulatory state tells them they have to do in terms of how they live their lives, what kind of energy they use and how much energy they use. Wow. Myron, thank you. This time, this time has really flown by. We've covered a lot of ground here, but I feel like we've also covered just a, a piece of, uh, of, of the continent. And uh, it's thank been you, a Bill. great conversation. And, and so thanks for, your, uh, thanks for doing this. I'd like to have you back, and maybe we'll talk about how we can get Congress to do their job during the next uh, Let's next think segment. about that before we start talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know quite how. That would be a pretty short show, I think. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thank you for time, taking the time to listen into the Bill Walton Show, watch the Bill Walton Show. We've been with Myron Ebel from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, brilliant man, much to learn from him about the environment and, uh, and uh, global, global uh, challenges we face. Uh, please join me for the next show. We'll have something equally interesting, I'm sure. Thanks for listening. Want more? Be sure to subscribe at thebillwaltonshow.com or on iTunes.